Hello, everybody. Some pretty interesting news coming out of the United States again. So now it is Oaklo who has signed letters of intent with Big Data uh, to basically build new small modular reactors that run on nuclear waste and which then can power big data centers. So that's the news today. Uh, I'm going to show you the news details this is something that you can find in the description down below so if you want to know more about this you can visit the website yourself it says oklo secures partnerships for up to 750 megawatts of power for us data centers so what are we going to discover in this video we are going to discover where the data demand is where the data center demand is coming from we're going to see what breeder reactors are we are going to learn something about the EBR2, which was one of the best breeder reactors that ever ran. Then we are going to consider some other breeder reactor uh, history, basically. And finally, we, go, we are going to take a look at the plans of Oklo and see how they fit in this la larger narrative. So, where does the data center demand come from? And this is a very interesting question because right now, if you're watching this video, this video is probably being hosted by a data center from Google. Now, there are currently more than five and a half thousand data centers in the US and demand for more data centers is growing. So I'm going to show you a map in a couple of minutes and what you see nearly practically any large data center that is owned by Microsoft or by Meta, Facebook, Amazon, you name it. All of those data centers, they, they conglomerate, basically. You get, you get clusters of more data centers. And the biggest cluster of data centers is in Virginia, in the neighborhood of Washington, D.C. And these data centers, generally, generally, they need a lot of energy. Currently, data centers, you have to account for roughly 25, 30, maybe even 40 megawatts. Right, it's, it's still in the megawatt scale, but everything is getting better even in the data center world. And what you see is that demand is growing from 20 gigawatts, which it is roughly these days, up to 35 gigawatts by 2030. And what is happening inside these data centers is, is what is especially interesting because the average power consumption per data center is growing. And this is because what we're doing in the computer world, you know, everybody knows about Moore's law, right? Moore's law is is practically that it's no longer applicable to uh, to to transistors to to CPUs you know central processing units, uh, but we still see that they want to cram as much processing power into a as small as possible computer chip. So, but we're right now we're 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 down to you know we we can still miniaturize more. But the question is whether we can actually make them more efficient because what you see right now is that they are trying to put as many transistors on a chip as possible, even if that means putting chiplets on top of a CPU, that you have multiple chips per CPU. All of this is just basically turning each square centimeter in as much data processing power as possible. And what you see, you see more of these chips per server you see more of these servers per rack you see more of these racks per data center and in the end what you see is a again a pretty exponential growth in energy demand from these data centers because their processing power is still growing and it's growing quite rapidly so let's take a look at the map that i prepared for us today so over here we see a map of all the data, not all the data centers, but the largest data centers in the United States that I could find. I'm going to zoom into Virginia uh, near Washington, as you can see. And what you see here is all of these, these boxes, these different colored um, figures that I've drawn over them. That's to highlight where the data centers are. So here are a couple of data centers, right? Usually what you see uh, there is some kind of a uh, switch yard near one of these data centers like this over here. And from there, the power then gets fed into this building. What you see over here, this is pretty interesting, right? All these things that you see, this, these, these stacks, these rows of these contraptions that sit outside the building, those are actually, again, transformers because they need to... Uh, to, to get the voltage down in order to get to, you know, it's only a couple of volts that needs to go into a PC. 
uh, preferably less than 12 if if you're inside and a, a, a central processing unit it, it, uh, it maybe a volt maybe two volts but not much more than that but still even even if you have this tiny processing unit and and it only eats like you know let's let's say it's 1.4 volts they still need 150 200 300 watts of power and there's there's thousands upon thousands of these chips inside these buildings and that's why they need so much power that they even need their own switchyard and their and their own power delivery infrastructure it's just that interesting it's that much power usage in one of these buildings now there's also other things that i want to show you in a couple of minutes but we're going to get back to this particular sheet so what happened before we see that amazon made a deal with x energy we said a, we saw a new deal from google and kairos power we saw that microsoft is trying to revive three mile island we see that oracle is planning to do a lot of stuff with nuclear and even nvidia and diablo canyon have announced a shared ai project i have no idea what what i what i have to expect from that uh, i'm a big fan of nvidia all my videos are rendered on nvidia video cards so uh, I'm, I'm really interested to see what that is going to be so why breeder reactors why would these uh these these big tech companies think about breeder reactors the the issue is nuclear waste and it's not all nuclear waste because there's many different sorts of nuclear waste uh think about you know fission products for instance if you leave your fuel in a reactor and you use it to create electricity what you do is you split atoms and each of these halves of these atoms that were split those are fission products and generally those we can't use anymore but we also have something else uh, which is called depleted uranium and depleted uranium is what you're left with once you have enriched uranium which you need to run your light water reactors on uh, but you know you always are left with a lot of uranium 238 that you don't use for anything so what you do or what the united states does is basically uh, they store this in a place called paducah so let's go to paducah it's in kentucky right over here right we zoom into paducah over here you see the paducah gaseous diffusion plant and when we zoom down over here you see all these uh, special containers and, and all those containers is stored 750,000 tons of uranium 238 and this uranium 238 is basically fuel for breeder reactors if you have a light water reactor which is not a breeder reactor it still does breed a little fuel so what you have is five percent uranium 235 and you have 95 percent uranium 238 now you want to split the uranium 235 that's where you get your energy from but it's unavoidable that some of the neutrons that that you get from this these fissions that they get captured by uranium 238 atoms and then they turn into plutonium right and that's basically what a breeder reactor also does but the difference between a light water reactor and a breeder reactor is that in a breeder reactor you have much more fissile material so much more uranium 235 or much more plutonium 239 and that's surrounded by a blanket of uranium 238 and you have a lot of neutrons going around in this reactor core and those that get out and you know interact with uranium 238 in the blanket that basically turns into plutonium 239 and that in turn becomes new fuel for other reactors so a breeder reactor creates more fissile material than it consumes and that's different from a light water reactor that we use in practically all cases and through this method we can extract more power of out of the uranium than that we have mined and, and that's how we can greatly increase fuel efficiency so i personally i think that it is good practice to enhance your fuel efficiency if you look at the figures over here 750 tons of uranium 238 right what you can do suppose it gets split every atom that's in there right each ton then yields roughly 24 terawatt hours per year each ton of uranium that's that's an incredible number because if you then if you then multiply that by 750,000 then you then you see that there's 18 million terawatt hours worth of electricity in those 750,000 tons 
that are stored at Paducah. And if you then consider that the U.S. only uses 4,000 terawatt hours per year in terms of electricity, then you see that there's, there, you know, you can, you can fuel the, the, all the electricity needs of the United States as it was in 2023 a couple of thousand times with the stuff that is lying around in those casks in Paducah. So it's, it's an incredible energy source. And it would be incredibly cool and great and awesome if we actually managed to start using that instead of considering it as being waste. So what happens in these fast reactors? I already gave you a little bit of the, of the information. You have a core with a lot of fissile material, uranium-235 or plutonium-239, and that's surrounded by a blanket. You know, it's a thick layer of fuel pallets of just uranium-238. So this reactor core is basically humming along quite nicely. You have all your fissions going on and you get a lot of energy out of this core, but also the excess neutrons that then get into this blanket, they interact with uranium-238 that's in there and that then turns into plutonium-239. Now what you have to do after a while, you have to take this blanket out of the reactor send it over to some facility somewhere where they can extract the plutonium, then remix that in with new fuel, and that becomes your new reactor core. Now, the neutron economy for breeding sufficient amounts of plutonium-239 is much different from a light water reactor. You can't slow the neutrons down, and you want to have a lot of them. So uh, that's basically why a fast breeder reactor really is different from a light water reactor. So, some history about the EBR-2. First, the EBR-1. So, EBR stands for Experimental Breeder Reactor. That was the first, the world's first power reactor, which was in the, in the 1950s, I believe. Then the EBR-2, which was the second experimental breeder reactor, a lot bigger than the previous one. And it also had a lot of buildings surrounding it. Surrounding it and it had an integral, well, not an integral, but it, it had its own reprocessing building connected to it. The EBR-2 was a very interesting thing. And what is even more important is that the EBR-2 ran for 30 years from 1964 until 1994. So we really know how these things work. It's not a big mystery. And if you want to know, there have been 23 breeder reactors that have existed so far. Not all of them were liquid metal fast breeder reactors. But currently there are five fast breeder reactors operational today, two in Russia, one in India and two in China. I've also made sure that there's a link to this Wikipedia page about breeder reactors down below. And there's a lot of interesting information that you can find there if you want to know more about breeder reactors. So the plans of Oklo. So what they seem to be planning right now, and, and, and please uh, don't quote me on this because all I have is secondhand information. Everybody only has secondhand information because a lot of the details are not shared with the outside world for good reason, by the way. So what they seem to be doing is they want to build a modernized version of the EBR2 because the EBR2 has distinguished itself. It has proven itself. And if you want to do a fast metal breeder reactor, what you do is you take a proven concept and you modernize it. What they want to achieve is that they have their first unit up and running by 2030. They want to start running these reactors on recycled nuclear waste. So it's probably going to be a lot of plutonium-239 that the United States needs to, needs to basically get rid of. And they want to have a central off-site reprocessing facility because you need to reprocess the stuff that's in the blanket. You can't do it in the reactor core. You have to take it out of the reactor core. You have to transport it to a central facility somewhere. There you have to reprocess the fuel and then you can stick it into a new core again. But that's that's the whole that's the whole idea behind breeder reactors. So what's interesting uh, if you look at what they are planning, uh, they, 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 they are designing a 15 megawatt unit, and I believe that it can be scaled up to 50 megawatts. So I'm looking at this from a 50 megawatt perspective. What they seem to have is they have already 1,350 megawatts of potential reactor deployments lined up, and the last letter of intent added another 750 megawatts, reaching a potential order book of 2100 megawatts. Now, 
what I think is very important and one thing that we need to start demanding from the entire nuclear industry is that they st actually start building reactors because these over here, those are intentions and intentions are good, but we really need real construction projects. So I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, Oklo start their first construction project somewhere in Idaho probably or somewhere else, who knows. But this is something that I'm certainly looking out for and with that you've made it to the end of this video i want to thank my paying patreon members and in particular terrestrial energy and the anthropocene institute because those guys really help me keep the lights on at home and if you want to help me feed my family please consider becoming a tier one tier two or maybe even a tier five member of my patreon page now if you want to add something to the discussion you can do so by leaving a comment down below and if you didn't or haven't already subscribed to the channel you can always do so now thank you all for watching and may the strong force be with you bye bye <coughs>